<laughs> I, I used to be the director. I guess I've been upgraded. <laughs> Uh, about a year ago, I got a phone call, and the person on the other end of the line said, uh, this is Will Bruder. I'm going to be in L.A. in about a week. Uh, I'd like to stop by and talk to you. And uh, can I have a few minutes? And I said, sure. And he said, I'm interested in seeing what you're doing these days. And uh, about a week later, Will came by with a friend. And we started talking, and this was the first time I had met him. I think he, had, he said he had been through the house once before, and we sat, and those few minutes turned into quite a few hours. And it seemed that we had quite a bit in common, and I really enjoyed uh, this particular young architect. And while we were talking, he said, I put together an exhibit that I've, uh, that's going to be in the uh, exhibit in Arizona, and it would could it, is it possible that Sire could be interested in having this exhibit? And <clears throat> I said, about when? He said, probably in the spring. And I said, that would probably work out very well, because we're in the fall, the, the program is pretty well put together. And by spring, uh, the, we could use an exhibit, and, and uh, I'd be interested in seeing you know, your full work. He showed me a little bit of his work, and I hadn't really been familiar that much before with Will. Uh, so my feeling was, knowing that we had an, a, a program that was going to feature primarily uh, young architects from the East and some of the other stars from the West, that possibly somebody who would be working like Will in a, in a neighboring state, Arizona, which we, who, a state where most of you don't see work from too often because we're so inundated by uh, the magazines that, that constantly show us work from other places, whether it be Europe or the East Coast, or sometimes, as I say, from the West Coast, but not too much from Arizona. And I thought it would be maybe a welcome relief to have someone like Will, who really doesn't talk as much about his architecture as he does architecture. Uh, this year is really, as he told me today, is his 10th anniversary of being in practice. And so in 10 years, He's produced about 200 pieces of work. Uh, most people produce about two these days in that same period of time. And so it's really rather phenomenal uh, for any young architect to produce that kind of work, uh, at least in, in my mind. I, I thought I did a lot of work when I was a young man. I probably produced about oh, 60, 70 jobs in that same period of time, and I always sort of patted my back, myself on the back for having done that much work. So we have a very energetic young architect tonight that's going to uh, present his work. And Will actually came through a process which I've learned recently, having once having become acquainted with him, seeing his work in Toshi Jutaku, and then just this month in the AIA Journal, he was interviewed as one of six from the 60s uh, by another architect uh, who, or writer, who decided to go back and see what happened to all these guys that were growing up with all these ideals in the 60s. And uh, Will was one of these people, and, and uh, he was interviewed at that time. I got to know a little bit more about him through that interview, and I'd like to share that for a few minutes because I don't know if he'll talk about himself. Uh, <clears throat> Will was not educated st strictly in architecture. He was always interested in architecture. Uh, be started began by working for an architect. He, he originally was going to go work for a GM and, and designed cars and decided he didn't like that uh, particular process, decided to come back to his home state, I think of Wisconsin, and uh, I guess decided he would go to IIT. This, this was always a strange one for me to hear because it's interesting to know what this guy would have been like if he had ever gone to IIT. But instead he decided to go to Wisconsin, which didn't have an architecture school, and take engineering classes and art classes and graduated uh, with a sculpture degree at the same time as he was working for architects uh, while doing this. And then instead of going on to graduate school somewhere, he decided to get his feet wet and become uh, and started to really look at the work of architects rather than studying architecture. And he became obviously very involved with Frank Lloyd Wright, with uh, Bruce Goff, worked with Soleri, then later went to work for Gunnar Burkert's, decided he liked the warm weather better, went back to Arizona, and uh, really went to work full blast. Uh, he, the way he had called me on the phone, I think, is the way he 
deals in architecture. He meets people, he sees their work, he cares about their work, he shares his work. It's a very uh, special kind of an arrangement, I think, uh, that most people uh, just don't do. He's a, an architect who really goes at it. He throws himself into it. He has a hell of a lot of energy. He produces and produces and produces, and I think he learns by producing. And uh, I think it's a treat to see this kind of work in relationship to uh, the kind of thing that we have been seeing. And I'm not putting down what we've been seeing. I think it's another way of looking at architecture. Uh, it's very much the way people look at, at, at their work today. They, they like to really talk about it, look into it, uh, take, you know, uh, spend a lot of words. And tonight, I, I think we're in for less words and a lot more visuals. Will Bruder. I, I probably don't have to say anything more than that. That was, that was 12 years ago. Uh, I think some of you who are here tonight probably were here at that lecture. And uh, it was uh, enjoyable to really introduce Will at that time. Uh, since then, Will has continued his energetic pace and his voracious appetite for architecture. And we have kept in touch through these years. And it's always enjoyable for me to hear Will's voice on the other end of the line uh, with his enthusiastic critique of some place or some piece of architecture that he has just flown to see. Uh, these 12 years have also uh, taken Wilt, I think, to a special place in the architecture community. He is the architect of Phoenix and Arizona, and his influence uh, is really great there. He has influenced a young group of design-build architects who are the only people doing anything special in Arizona. He's taught, he's lectured, he's juried, his last two were PA and LA awards here. He received the Rome Prize in 1987. And over these years, he has completed another body of award-winning houses, uh, along with such diverse projects as car washes, uh, a synagogue, a small community building, a small museum, community libraries, and of course, his most recently very well-published Phoenix Central Library, or as it's called in Phoenix, the Will Bruder Library. <clears throat> as I said in my early introduction that you saw, I think you're in for a different kind of architectural presentation tonight. Uh, Will talks quite a bit. I, at those days, I think he talked a little less. But uh, he is what I call a shoot-from-the-hip type of an architect and he uses such classical architectural expressions as slam dunk and all nine yards. Will Bruder. Thank you very much for that interesting introduction. I mean, we could just play the whole tape. It would be curious, but scary, I'm sure. Uh, because life is about learning, life is about mistakes, life is about maturing, and uh, always waking up to the next sunrise. What I'd like to do here for a second now is we're going to get rid of the podium. I'm going to sit down in the audience. We're going to move the sound down so that uh, posterity is served, I guess. And uh, I'd like to have a dialogue with a bunch of images that I brought along and uh, see where we go from there. So let's turn out the spotlight. Let's get rid of the podium. and. Uh, Over this period of time, I sort of, sort of just survived the postmodern plague of the 70s. Um, I've just been doing my thing for a long time. Uh, this evolution started in the late 60s. And it's been the sort of you know, search for finding myself and, and, and celebrating the, the, the art of listening. I really believe that architecture's most primal event is the act of listening to our clients 
interpreting, becoming an editor to their wishes, finding out the pragmatism of their needs and the poetry of their desires. We work in, because of our clients, not in spite of our clients, contrary to what the normal rag on the street is, because it's all too easy to make excuses for why we don't do rather than why we can do. Over this period of time that I've grown up, the stylisms and the operative words have changed often. And there's a word that we talk about that came about really with this sort of birthing of, of other realities of community, which I think is very valid, which is called regionalism. And it started to be about an issue quite simply of a region being a micro place, possibly a, a valley north of a great desert city like Phoenix, possibly the desert itself, possibly the, the region. But I really think that we're in total denial if we accept any fact short of being global regionalists. In a day of CNN, of MTV, of the net, surfing all these wonderful things, how can we any more limit ourselves, our influences, in any colloquial way to a mere valley or a mere small point in the geography? So the world that I live in and work in is the world you live in, and it's represented in that nice view from space on the left. As we work in the West, we really are empowered and informed by the light. And what we see on the right is a typical sunset in Arizona. You know, I say typical because it's about this energy of light and sky that empowers the place and the landscape as well as the architecture and the art that people make there. Oops. And let me get, let's say they said this technology was foolproof and radio signals, so let's see. As we look at those environments, whether they be the forests of Finland, which are quite unique because of their pulp basis, I mean, these are pulp trees, and it's a, a quite different scale and texture, or whether we look at the spring desert outside my studio in New River and understand the intense micro and macro implications of those environments and all to be learned from, these are the places we work in the world. As we lay in a meadow under an aspen tree on the north rim of the Grand Canyon and try and understand the engineering of the, the flitting leaves above us and how they can miraculously play and filter the light and be so kinetic, as we come upon a great saguaro cacti that has 150 or 200 years of life as we stand next to it, and we understand its structure and its vitality to exist in this harsh climate and what that represents as, as learning diagrams for, for making an art and an architecture. And we look at the man-made, and I've been increasingly infatuated with the idea of runes. And as I look at ways of critting my own work, critting the work of my peers or students, I quite often hearken back now to the idea of what is a rune and what is our mystification with runes. We look at structures of intention over ages, and what we see in a rune are ideas. And as I ask the question of what does a rune mean, I look at what architecture has to, in essence, be about, and that is ideas. Imagine a project on your board today that you might have left to come to this lecture, and think about what it might be 100 years from now with no care, with no love, no maintenance. What would be the remnant of ideas that you have crafted and created? Would there be any is the operative question. Because I think as we drive to all, down all too many streets in LA or Boston or Phoenix, our landscape is littered with buildings without ideas. We look at this setting on the south-facing cliff of a, an ancient culture in northeastern Arizona, and we see the remnant of stone walls and compa compatibility with this stone-set cliff. We know issues of security because there were the same roving problems probably in these neighborhoods at one level as we see today, and fortification and security was part of the diagram. But we see the magic of materials, we see the magic of light, we see the integration of community. And all too often, it's very easy to put these values on things as old as the site you see on the left at Navajo National Monument. And it's all too difficult to put it on our contemporary trappings and the vestiges of what we create as artists and architects. But as we look at the ruin on the right, its temporal life dates from 1941. It's the remnant at the time, it's been destroyed since, unfortunately, of a house by Frank Lloyd Wright. 
Pawson Ruin, Pawson Residence. It was a house built for two sisters from San Francisco. It had a very short life of merely a year and a half. We look at the artifact, though, of this ruin, and you have total legibility. You can imagine coming up the slope, entering through the passage under the great covered body of the house. It was equal parts wood as well as stone. You came to a vista on the overlook of the landscape of the desert beyond and the young city. You made the turn into the entryway here, the remnant of a kitchen, the steps down into a living room, the hearth where the fire occurred, the closet above. And you look at the power of these forms, and they became not only the ruin of these ideas, but they also became post de facto the really a, a place called Shiprock, a place for celebration and parties, a place where people were both transfixed and could meditate, and I'm sure that many people were conceived on the same site. <laughs> so again, it's interesting what places become in ruin. And I think that we have to put value in what we do or it isn't worth doing. Architecture is rather amazing also because buildings have the power to make places, to make communities. When we look back in time, we know the power of a place like Siena. We know the assembly of buildings over time to create this great civic place that is both sensual and intellectual and what it means to the history of culture and time. Architecture also has this great power to become symbol and become icon and become image. And it's interesting that something as contemporary as the Sydney Opera House, whose intentions actually by the competition were to represent the vitality of a young country in the early 50s, the continent, Australia, and how by the vision of not only the architect and the engineers that make it happen, but of the process, be it as corrupt and as screwy as any process we enter in today, somehow resulted in a symbol not only of a time, of a community, but literally of a country. How many times, I ask all of you, in the last month or two months, have you seen this image or images of this building and known instantly what that was all about and what it meant? Architecture has the potential to be very powerful to the nature of who we are and what we devise. It's great to be an architect because it's on, you're only as old as your, your mind lets you be. Body will move on, but it's all about mind. Here we have early work by Sigurd Leverant, a great Swedish architect that I hope all of you know. Asplund was his compatriot at a certain point, but we have the luxury of almost 70 years of practice from Sigurd Leverant. Here we have the robust work of a young architect and we have an exploration of a classical style that we had never seen before. The cemetery at East Malmo in Sweden. We look at columns, we look at capitals, we look at dentals. We look at all the makings of an architecture that was very classically influenced and yet was a reinvention of anything that had existed in the world to that point. So here we look at a man in his 20s. Here we look at the same man in his 90s or approaching 90. Same architect, same mind, learned experience, learned skills. The simple idea of a brick church outside Stockholm with the operative decision being, I will never cut the brick. I will play with joints, bed and head joints. I will move the brick through various articulations in space. I will use it to sculpt form. I will use it to play with light. I will create absurd joinery. I will create variety and ornament, but I will never cut the brick. A pretty simple game plan. You're only as old as you let your mind be. Mr. Leverant again, a simple six by six paving tile with one simple flick of the wrist, a rotation, a pattern, a joinery that energizes and invigorates such a mundane material. And again, a floor of brick playing with similar strategies. And I wonder what wonderful days they were as Sigurd stood in his black coat with his big black cigar over the masons laying each brick, making decisions in the field to create this great building. Architecture is about materiality, and materiality is about time. We look at the image on the left of Taos Pueblo Church. It's an image that's been painted by many, been photographed by many. 
George O'Keefe, Ansel Adams, probably two of the most distinguished players. And yet a simple discovery of a slide of, a, of an innocent young architect discovers plaster, earthen plaster, the passion of it, the movement of it, the rigor of it, the history of community in these mud walls, because again, it's about maintenance and love. And while we can visualize architecture that becomes ruined, we have to hope that we create buildings that inspire care and love and the sort of maintenance that every building really deserves and does need to maintain a life. But mud plaster, plaster nonetheless, or synthetic plaster on the right here. A synthetic plaster wall on a recent creation by Max Scoggin and Marilee Lamb. The bonding of the children, the users of the library in the wall in the construction process. And a wall becomes patinaed with new ornament and new life and new vitality of new architects working in new times both plaster walls. Joy is in the materiality of finding out where our materials come from. I challenge all of you, not only when you're in school, but when you're in practice and continually in life, to keep going back to the sources where the materials that we build from come. There's nothing finer than wandering a stone quarry, you know, in stone country of central Arizona, northern Arizona, and looking at the magnificence of form and shape and scale the rigor of the machinery that breaks and clips and marginalizes the stone. And we look at what the power and potential of that is. As we move forward to a time when stone might be appropriate in our work, those memories have to be carried. They always are. You learn continually, and you'll see through some of the diagrams tonight what, what that's all about. As we look at the wall on the right, I have the pride to say it's in one of my structures at the entry to Zion National Park. There was sort of a stoneness required and implied by the setting, I would say. We carefully searched for the stone. We looked at the quarry. It was wrong. We finally found an overlook at, look, overlooking the, the, the Grand Canyon on BLM land. And we carefully barred apart the stone. We cleft it separate. We put it on the back of a truck. And we brought it to the site in southern Utah. I never met the mason that laid this wall before the wall was laid. I shared my ideas about stonework and my work and images of it. We laid a sample wall, the owners and myself, in the backyard so that when we found the right mason, we would have a small guideline or maquette to build from. And finally, after a period of time, Sabrina found the mason in town that she thought was the guy to do the deal. For about a week, he would lay samples, and each time she left in disgust because they obviously wasn't, there wasn't a, a chemistry happening. Finally, she was so disgusted after the struggle of trying to explain our desire for almost no joint showing, the shadow, the relief, the pattern, the texture, the randomness, that she gave up and went to California to visit her parents for a while. You know, not sure what she would, refer to, re, would return to, but totally disgusted with the process. Lo and behold, she returned, and there was about three foot of this wall laid, and obviously communication had been made. There was an energy here. There was an understanding. And again, hopefully the dynamic of, of your presence and your ideas will invigorate and stimulate the craftsman to those sort of reaches. Another bogus idea of 20th century America is that the craftsman is dead. Cheap excuse of inept architects not wanting to push their limits. There is pride in this country. There is pride of doing and making. It's evidenced in everything we see in our built environment. It's ours to challenge that pride into our work and our dreams. I did have the pleasure of thanking this mason after the fact when the job was done for what he had created. Back to Mr. Leverant. He never quit smoking. This is the last building by Sigurd Leverant. He's just over 90 years old at this point. It's done in the late 60s. The simplest, most modest of materials in concrete. Early use of thermopane glass. Simple, bold clips of Z's of steel bolted to the wall these wonderful minimalist paintings of the sky embracing this, this building. The building is a flower shop. It's a flower shop at the entry to the East Malmo Cemetery. So while you buy flowers here, you pace, place them in the crypt at that first place I showed you with the two classical columns. Here within less than 300 meters are a beginning work and an ending work, and the mind never stopped thinking. We look at the simplicity of modest materials like concrete and think what they can be and what they can be for us. And we look at what Mr. Leverent discovered, and of course we know what Mr. Scarpa discovered, a rather phenomenal you know, 
reinvention of what this age-old material through time could become. A little bit of concrete, a little bit of good form work, a bit of water, a bit of rain, a lot of magic. And there is the architecture of unintention. And that has its place, and its places to be learned from. We look at a simple research greenhouse in Tucson, Arizona on the left. We have trusses that Will Bruder would be proud of. We have trusses that Peter Rice would be proud of. And maybe even Mike Ishler here sitting next to me. We look at what that's all about. It's minimal use of corrugated plastic, simple tables, an earthen floor. Maybe, maybe Donald Judd was here, who knows. But again, there was no real intention here, so we can only learn and enjoy from the sensual of this moment and try and understand from the rigor of why it existed. Budget, ease of construction, timeliness, you know, all sort of mundane things, and yet poetry was achieved. We look at the riprap in the Rio Grande River. This is from my real home, Albuquerque, as noted on your poster. Uh, <laughs> This is the Will Bruder from New River, not Albuquerque, that's here tonight. But this is Albuquerque, and I have learned a lot in that town. Here's the Corps of Engineer with no aesthetic intention, building riprap to protect from flooding. And yet look at the wonderful dance of the weathered steel across the river bottom in the best spirit of any of the best expressionist sculpture of the 60s. But again, intention is so much more. As artists and architects, we have a higher calling to our society. The lightning field here by Walter De Maria, south of Zuni, north of the plains of St. Augustine where the VLA telescopes, radio telescopes to space are placed. We have a great intervention that teaches us unbelievable things about who we are as people and what this world and nature is about. 400 simple poles of stainless steel precisely, perfectly placed in a landscape in a confines of a mile by a kilometer, in a rather desolate place with no real markers of civilization. And as we visit there, we don't need the lightning to make it come alive and give us learning and give us messages. All we need is our eyes and our senses and our mind. And whether it be a wonderful artist like Martiel Langsdorf here, a fine painter and graphic artist from Chicago, or a man at the end of his life to a certain degree, Alexander Langsdorf sitting in the rocking chair, who worked on the Manhattan Project, staying in the little homesteader's cottage on the edge of the field, and enjoying and understanding this marriage of intention and rediscovery again about the world. We have great things to learn as artists and architects from these works, these searches of our time for new truths, for new ideas. We moved to the coast of San Sebastian in Basque country between Spain, or on the edge of Spain and France. And we look at the work of Chida, the great Spaniard, the great sculptor. It's his hometown. He sets up a collaboration with an architect. And they create a small piazza, a small plaza where the sea meets the land. We have three sculptural devices primarily, great cast forms of steel, wrought mammoth things of the foundry and the forges that build the industry of the landscape of, of Spain. And the first visit I had there with my wife was at sunset, and it was a harsh night. And you saw light escaping. You saw the meeting of water and land. And you had it re-edited and defined by these wonderful sculptures. You're on the edge of this plaza. The next day, we went back at lunch. It was still a fairly stormy day. And as I'm known to do, my camera is my sketchbook, and I sort of recorded the moment, recorded my understanding, thought about the movement patterns of the plaza, the placement of risers and seats and chairs and walls. Thought I had it all figured out, but it was still a fairly intimate moment. The night before, there were maybe four or five of us out on the point. At lunch this day, because it was rather unclement, there was maybe a dozen people. So the camera was put away. The, you know, we'd enjoyed the moment. It was on to the next adventure. And lo and behold, as we marched back to the town, two school bus arrived at the plaza. And suddenly, everything that I had preordained about my understanding of this architecture and this art were thrown to the wind, literally. Because as these hundred children attacked the place, they came at it from diagrams and with choreography and movement that I never could have thought of in a thousand years. They took it over as a group. They took it over in solitude as individuals. 
and they came and there was an entire new understanding of the place that was invigorated and charged by their presence. And this is much the reality of anything you will build in your lives as architects. There will be a moment of quiet on a very intimate level of the micro and will be there these other manifestations of empowerment by people. And that's what will be your joy is to watch as both of those occur and the reactions to what that's about. Again, fortunately, we learn things in life and we don't shut down in any moment. I mentioned to Michael Rotundi that probably the most negative thing about an education is a degree. And I say that not for the accomplishment of the degree, but for the false security that the degree presents to so many people. A degree bears a certain sense of finality and all that education about is another step on a journey. So throw away that paper when you get it, put, in a, put it in a drawer, keep it there so you can record it as you pursue your license and your credentials and your opportunities to build, but it means nothing more, actually a lot less than the paper that it's printed on. I really am embarrassed with the reality that I missed about all the major crystal events of my lifetime because I discounted them. I looked at those engineering events of throwing cables across canyons, about rigging, about all these interventions of our normal engineering culture, and mis mistook Christo and his wife's efforts for similar juxtapositions with a bit more cavalierness to them. When I was working on Central Library, it was an afternoon that I had spent in Arab's offices here working out details and some of the first ideas for the building when Christo was doing the Umbrella Project. This was back probably, time flies, but I think it was about 1990, 91. And it was the time that this was going on, so we left a long day of work and invention at Arab's office, and we hit the road, we streaked through the San Fernando Valley, did the freeway trip out through the valley, out across, out to the site. And we experienced it at 75 miles an hour, and we experienced it at 50 miles an hour, and 20 miles an hour, and 10. We got out of our car. You know, we had all of an hour and a half to enjoy it that afternoon. But we enjoyed it at many different scales, and it, suddenly it was another awakening. And I really believe that Christo and his wife are probably two of the greatest architects living in this century. I say that because of the rigor and the ability they, they have had to work with the bureaucracy, to finance projects, to work with multiple disciplines, with working with multiple ownerships, with bringing together the camaraderie of craftsmanship. You know, the whole thing, when you think about it, you know, any building I've ever done in my life, including the struggles and the, the, the striving of Central Library, is a mere nothing compared to the magnitude of these inventions of this artist. And what this artist gives us by the, these artists give us by their their, their, their minimal invention of, of, of a mere speck of time is so critical also to the appreciation, the event they become. They're, they're powerful markers of our, of our time and our culture. And as I left back to the valley, back to the airport to Phoenix that night, the San Fernando Valley was never so beautiful because light had passed and the street lights had come on. As I looked at that landscape of roads and cul-de-sacs and street lights and ticky-tacky houses, I remembered the beacons of the umbrellas strung out on that same landscape. And again, there was another sort of logic and purity, as well as corruption, that was evident to me. And I was able to appreciate life and who I was a lot better. So art and architecture are really meaningful as we grow. And again, I encourage all of you not to attach yourselves to dogma, but to develop personal philosophies that are of the reality that will, you will know something tomorrow you don't know today, and it will be a philosophy that will allow you that growth to experience. Nothing is worse than dogma that puts handcuffs on us in the name of avant-garde or doing something unique. The idea of listening really was given to me as the greatest gift from a man named Bruce Goff. Bruce Goff, the creator of this wonderful piece of architecture on the left, the Babinger House, his true masterwork, because no man ever listened to a client better than Bruce Goff. His houses are not the eccentric wanderings of a, of a cavalier mind making his own fantasies. And I say that because unlike a lot of my writing experiences where I met third and fourth and fifth owners, at the period I was searching out Goff in the 60s, I met a lot of first-time owners. So I sat in their living rooms, I looked at the 
the, the strangeness, the macabre with them, and I understood why it was, because it was them. It was to celebrate their glass collection that these bizarre jagged walls and windows and bays of glass were made. It was to celebrate their bad eyesight that clean, hard finishes were, were, were set up. It was people's houses, people's architecture, and this man had this ability to, to transform their dreams into a built reality to grow their lives in. The photograph here is approximately 28 years ago, my first visit to the Bavinger house. I had the pleasure of visiting the house about a month and a half ago, and the pleasure that Gene and, and, and Babinger and his wife were still alive, and they once again were gracious to let me visit. And it was interesting because I came to the house with Sambo Mockby, a friend that I had made two days earlier, a very distinguished architect from Alabama. And he's quite a character for any of you that have met him, and we sort of hit it off instantly. He also wears Red Wing work boots still. He has sort of a scruffy look about him. And we hit it off, and we're driving down the road. He had never been to this house, and even though he was a Bruce Goff scholar last fall at Oklahoma. We drove down the road. He sort of saw this house peeking above the trees, and we came into the driveway. He looked at me, and he said, God damn you, Bruce Goff, you're bad. I thought I was bad. I don't know what bad is. <laughs> and then it was funny because he got out of the car, and we had this appointment at 10 o'clock. And he didn't want to go in the house because he was afraid the dream would end, that you know, he suddenly would have to go back to Kansas. I mean, it was really bizarre. But again, this is really bad architecture. I mean, it really is that great spontaneity and that reality that you always have something to strive for. There's always another guy better around the corner. You know, you really always got to keep on your toes and keep reaching because that's what life is all about. I also had the good fortune among many wonderful people I've met, and Ray and Shelley have been major to my, my growing and my maturing. But in 1970, when I returned to the desert, I discovered the reality of a man named Paul Schweiker, a second generation modern master. And by my good fortune, he had retired to a mountaintop in Sedona, Arizona, and he had built a house on that mountaintop. And that house taught me, as well as Paul did, the importance of tectonics, what materials were, what a bolt meant to go through a piece of wood. There's an interesting engineering story here because when Paul built this house, he was a man approaching 70. He certainly celebrated his first visit to Japan in the 30s as a young man, but he was constantly growing. He had done the entire structural engineering package as well as the working drawings for this house out on the mountaintop. And just checking himself, as we always have to be checked, and, and we always need good critics to anything we do. We can't march alone. And he sent back for critique to his engineer in Pittsburgh his drawings and calculations. Got a nasty phone call immediately from his engineer of years and said, gee whiz, I thought I taught you better, Paul. You've oversized all the beams. You don't have to do this. Paul said, what do you mean? Have you checked it laterally? No. Well, check it laterally and call me back and tell me how bad everything's sized after you've checked it. Well, it turned out because there are no walls in the east-west direction and it's literally a deck of cards, all of the beams are analyzed to take the lateral forces through the building to a beautiful sculpted diagonal wind truss at the far eastern end of the house. So nothing was oversized. It was merely sized for the complexity of the tasks that the architect had created. So from Paul, I learned not only about the total nature of materials and making things, but about that sort of rigor of invention and commitment to the quality of what you make. And I did learn a great deal from Paolo Solari as an apprentice at Cosanti. I had the pleasure of not only working on the arcology idea and developing the drawings that were maturing in Paolo's head at that time and be a contributor to that, but I learned from the heat of pouring bronze and I also learned from the frugality of the place and I owe much to my being from that understanding. We never had any money at Cosanti. Everything was beg, borrow, or steal, literally. We would each spend an afternoon each week in 120 degrees straightening nails because it was a violation to throw away a bent nail. We didn't have money for more. So we would all stand around a table with a hammer, smashing our fingers, straightening nails for the next formwork we were to build. And yet those lessons are important things that I carry to me today as I struggle to do a $70,000 house for a retired librarian and it's things that I brought to the building of the Central Library for the City of Phoenix. 
And we look at one extreme here, and these models belie the diversity of the two characters, because again, Paulo Solari is about the earth, about this organicness of these structures and the making of bells. And Gunnar Burkert's was all about the rigor of a methodology and a creativity which surrounded Erosernin. He was of that school. He was a one, of that wonderful moment in time when so many wonderful things grew and the energy of that man. So in my year of apprenticeship with Gunnar, it was like water and, and oil, but I learned so much that looking back now 20 years, it's almost frightening what I learned about drawing, about thinking, about the process of making. And I encourage all of you as you pursue your education to go on to work for people that you've come to respect, people that you can admire that are doing the art of architecture. Don't get caught in the simple rationalization of going and working for some mediocre firm on the hopes that someday you'll do it yourself. Because again, hopefully you're having a good education and you'll take things from that. It's a two-way street education. Hopefully you'll go and work for a great office or a good office that's really reaching and doing ideas and you'll learn from that. And so when you get your license and you embark on what your chosen career is, to be a member of a team, to be an individual, to go pound nails, I don't care, to make things, you will have the basis for making decisions and keeping your intent, integrity and making your dreams happen. That year of water and oil with Gunnar was that sort of learning experience for me, and I owe a great deal to that. Return to the desert in 1970 after the film froze in the camera on one of the expeditions and actually cracked. I said that was enough of cold weather. Never want to experience that again. Return to the desert, I had three years to finish my apprenticeship. I took my exams in 1974, sitting next to somebody with a traditional education, passed the exam the first time, Opened my studio with two small patios and a $15,000 cabin, but it was time to fly. One year later, after helping build that cabin with the client and a few of those patios, on the 10 acres that my wife and I had acquired in New River, Arizona, we built a little 850 square foot house in 1975, starting on the 1st of August, moving in Labor Day, four weeks, four friends, $12,000. It was home. It was office, it was studio. About 500 feet to live in, this was the living room, the bedroom and the dining room, with the kitchen over here. <laughs> the galvanized metal floor cost $9 a square, nine cents a square foot, and it lasted 10 years, so that was less than a penny a year, not a bad investment. There's now a nice Endicott tile on the floor. The studio seemed, soon became too small, it was about 18 by 16, and five guys were not real comfortable in that space. And so three years later, not floating on the desert, but carefully surgically implanted in the desert, the studio grew of concrete and steel and glass, oriented it such that we get no direct sun penetration in summer and deep penetration from the south in winter. It's a double insulated shell over these trusses. And again, my work is about materialities that I learned in making jewelry and pouring bronze and carving stone throwing pots, and the experiences I've built for myself in life. I pay some luxury for all this glass because there is an ambient temperature differential, but we will all make choices in our life. We will rationalize those choices. We will make values. But the important thing is that we can go to bed at night and know that we've done the choices we feel that we can live with and sleep with. Simple space. Everybody laughs at the studio when they see these slides because it's become filled with books and drawings and computers. My studio staff is made of basically, we're about six and a half right now. There's four young architects that work with me and an administrative assistant and one of my old clients helping on the side. She didn't want to really require, retire, so she catalogs my library and becomes a cheerful voice on the phone and she's always there to buoy us all up, sort of like the, a den mother, but she's quite wonderful. And again, it's about this space where things happen. It's a scale of a space and it's the I've looked at to, to, to make my bigger dreams happen, the future of associations and reaching out, the, the kind, of, kind of teamwork that I've come to learn is what makes things really happen. So this is the base in New River that if you come to visit me in the desert, you'll be welcomed at this door. And life is interesting. From one of those little patios I mentioned that I had to go out on my own, a year and a half later this project grew on the right. 
The date is 1974 to 1976. It's the backyard of a $28,000 tract house. It's three foot from the property line of this tract subdivision, and we built a little fantasy in concrete, water, glass, a little sculptural retreat, a home office. The couch opens up for a guest room, a great place to have a glass of wine before a nice dinner at the main patio or a house, a little fantasy in suburbia. And it was very interesting because when it was completed, a woman came to write a story about it, to comment on it, and her husband was a Roman historian, a Roman architecture historian at ASU, and they talked about the great Roman or, or Italian influence of this building. I had no clue what that meant. I had not yet crossed the ocean. And when I was in Rome in 87, I, lo and behold, discovered a little round temple down near the Colosseum called the Temple of the Vestal Virgins. And in its scale, in the fluting of its columns, in the whole nature of it, this was, in fact, a Roman building. But more interesting to me was the fact that because we're all really so limited by the, what the media, media really wants to serve up to us as knowledge, that I could have worked for Carlos Scarpa instead of Gunnar Burkert's. Again, I learned a great deal from what I worked, but I didn't know Carlos Scarpa was alive. You know, I had not, I mean, and I thought myself pretty knowledgeable. I mean, I'm constantly embarrassed with my stupidity. You know, but anyways, PA comes out, the man's been dead three years, here's a cover story about Carlos Scarpa. Okay, so a new adventure to go in search of, I just didn't have flesh and blood at the end of it that was still alive. But it was interesting as I researched things that the same day that the formwork was being set, the concrete was being placed, the relationship of water to mass to sky in 1974 to 76 was the same day this building was being created in suburbia in Phoenix. Two men, opposite sides of their lives, opposite sides of the world, playing with the same palette, hopefully towards similar resolves. And I became the owner-builder architect, I became the do-it-yourselfer, I became the hippie guy as Metropolis noted recently. I became the 49-year-old hippie today, I guess. But anyways, my first clients came from the blue collar, not the upper middle class, because they had the soul and invention as they always have in America. The rich clients never have the courage, be they Mr. Getty or be they so many people, to really look at things. They play safe, they buy safe. But young people and, and people of lesser wealth are more prone to adventure. This was a blue collar guy in the back of a sheet metal shop that one day working on a building we were doing and he was the craftsman outfitting furniture and structure and other things and I was standing next to him with his tools. I said, gee whiz, this is a lot of fun, Will. Someday you're going to do a house for me and my wife. And I sort of discounted it politely but discounted it nonetheless. Two weeks later he came up to me and said, you know that house I told you about two weeks ago? Just bought the lot. You know, <laughs> we bought a trailer, we're moving there next week, we're selling our house, when can we talk about the house? And so this grew over the course of about four years with $70,000 in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. The rigor was three foot thick rubble masonry walls. It's a hexagonal module as you can see here. It grew in six lift, or lifts across a period of 48 weekends. He got four off for good behavior the first year. After that year of building, we assembled this space truss, if you will, 15,000 pounds, two and a half inch well drilling pipe and sucker rod in about one month sitting on the ground next to the house. It took us 10 minutes with an 80 ton crane to lift that roof, anchor to the walls, earth bonded to this other sort of desert insect creature, and over the course of another couple of years, a home was created. And here are a couple views of that home. Simple diagrams of materials and space and light and orientation. And again, a very vigorous client, and again, pushing those limits of people all the time. And it's interesting because with a house, you have to have both passion for what you create as well as compassion for the people you're creating it for. In public work, it's a bit different because other than compassion for a community or maybe the librarians you like, there's a bureaucracy often in place that are not worthy of compassion. <laughs> it's worry, worthy only of survival and beating the game. But in residences, always remember that your residential clients, those ordinary simple people, might be the most courageous people you ever meet in your life. I present a remodel because remodels are an important part of being an architect. I consider them important because my remodel work has taught me so much about my potentials to create from a blank sheet of paper. 
because it's one thing to have the blank sheet with the beautiful topo, the natural configurations that will influence and inform what I want to make. It's quite another thing to have the limitations of an archaeology that I had to, to decipher and value along with the other natural world or community that surrounds it. And in interpreting those things, and this is a building that I came upon in 1986, was completed in 1987, from an old 1946 warehouse, so this building was the same age as I was when I saw it, still is. We saw the potential of an old railroad siding in a debilitated area of town with a changing character being turned into a corporate headquarters. And with the etching of a sandblaster, with the careful analysis of its internal workings, trusses existed, merely not sandblasted, but air blasted, the rigor of a facade that could not be penetrated any longer by the nature and danger of the neighborhood, so we penetrated the roof instead, made a garden to focus around, sort of had the luxury into the 7,000 square feet with the programmed uses to be maybe fairly eccentric with the geometry of this corporate garden that we were creating. And we grew an architecture for $28 a square foot from furniture and fees and plants into reality. And again, it was these sort of lessons of lo that I've learned, the ability to, to be more free, driven by the confines of these walls and this roof, and the power that's implied to the other built work. I encourage you all in your work to pursue remodels, searching for ideas, not merely being decorators. I also say that we must do this if we are really to save our cities and create a new urbanism for this country as we enter the third millennium. And I do car washes, as Ray said, and I'm damn proud of it. I've done a series of car washes, and the reason that Charlene Silverman and Mike Ishler are sitting here tonight from Overup is the fact that when Charlene came to town, because I had the audacity to call London when I was thinking about doing a big building and thought they might be a nice player to play with, Charlene came over to check out this guy she'd never heard about, and we went looking around at some work, and I think as we drove up to the car wash, she said, we're yours, this is gonna be good. My first car wash was the best car wash in America. It was one of my finest awards because there were no architects on the jury. The jury was made up of people that owned car washes. It was a national jury. <laughs> and they looked at it and they said, not only does this make good sense as a car wash, but it looks pretty cool too. <laughs> Three years later, I was again commissioned to do a car wash by Mr. Weiss of Weiss Guys Car Wash. This adventure started with one of those courageous house builders because the first project was a house. We got it wet, the car wash support it, not at the, at the, the root of the wealth. So we tried another car wash and we learned a lot from the first one. So we, here we have, again, this is the statement of who I am. I love ordinary block and if block is my menu for any building, I call up all the yards or somebody in my studio does and we find out what are the current aggregates, what are blocks made of today, are you into the red cinder quarry or the black cinder quarry? Are you making your block with sand fines or cinder fines? You know, what is this, what is that? Because in the ordinariness of a block, there is great magic to be resolved in etching it and polychroming it and playing with it. I use black iron and not core 10 in the desert because we have 10 inches of rain a year and will be long gone and forgotten before any of these structures really wilt in the very least. I'm interested in technology at the edge and at this moment the role forming that was becoming popular in the 80s to do things that was a spin-off of the agribusiness methodology of roll forming became popular for architecture. And we were interested in what its potential might be. And this is an important building to look at from that standpoint because it also talks about the word no. And no, no is often complemented by the word why. Not to be belligerent, but to pursue knowledge. When Peter wrote, the project architect in the studio was assigned the task by Wendell and myself. Wendell is a a name that's been very important to me for the last 11 years. He was my right hand on the library. There's, there's a blurred line in the creation of many of my works. We both have stories about how this grew and when a team's really working, it is somewhat irrelevant. But again, there's these sort of marriages that happen. And when Wendell and I told Peter to, to pursue this sketch we had created and see how it could happen, he called five manufacturers of this technology. He was told no five times. 
we proceeded to ask Peter why the word no. Well, I hadn't pursued it any farther. I said, well, call them all back now and ask why. Well, in the pursuit of that questioning, we discovered that because of this complex geometry of a double curve, you had to take these long sheets out of the machine and put them back in to get the counterpoint curve. Most of the places that were having this equipment were in spaces not unlike where we lecture tonight with a ceiling about as high as we're sitting under. And as you put the double curve in the machine, there wasn't enough ceiling height to accomplish the task. It wasn't the equipment that wasn't capable. It was the environment that was unforgiving of doing what we wanted. So with a little nudging and a low bid, we got a contractor to put a roof scuttle over the machine so that any of you sitting here tonight can make a form like this or more complicated because somewhere in Orange County there is a building with a roof hole above that will allow somebody to dream weird dreams. Again, getting back to the nature of our clients and who they are. We work because of our clients, not in spite of our clients. Two retired school teachers building a dream on the edge of a volcano. We look at the materiality of that natural setting. We look at the cinder color and we look at the cinder color of a cinder block house. We look at a little courtyard house about the desert and from this view, as the appraisers said, what kind of house is this? There's no windows. What kind of fortress are you building here? It's interesting, it took me 35 years of, well, let's see, that's pushing a little bit. I've been at this now 32 years, so about 28 years of practice to figure out that the word appraisal has nothing to do with value. It's an oxymoron. Appraisal and value is an oxymoron, just like military intelligence. <laughs> what we have in appraisal especially after the boondoggles of the 80s and the corruption, is an appraiser is merely a person who is basically functionally illiterate, if it's anything other than or or ortho orthogonal, that comes to a set of drawings with the, the, the task assigned by the bank to put a appraisal or value on these documents, not as any me measure of aesthetics, not as any measure of functional worth, because all the buildings I'm showing you in residential form are called, what's that word they, they, they love to throw out? It's uh, not functionally an app, but it's something like that. And they, they immediately reduce the appraisal by 20%. But what they're looking at is can they turn this property, can the bank turn it in 60 days or less once the owner goes belly up and can't pay the mortgage? That is the bottom line of an appraisal. We look at the courage of somebody wanting to create a piece of architecture like a house when they all probably carry enough plastic in their wallet, be it a platinum card, be it a Discover card, be it whatever, that they could go wandering for their dream on a Sunday afternoon with a home section under their arm, find a house in built condition, put a down payment, run it through the, the, the plastic machine, and move in two weeks later. Instead of choosing to search out an architect, to search out a site, to develop an idea, to search for an appraiser, to search for a loan, to work with a building department, to find a contractor, and maybe if they're lucky, somewhere, anywhere from a year to two years later, move into their dreams. That's courage. And fortunately, we have a lot of courageous people, and they will come to you, and they will represent two or three percent of the population of this land only. And so you owe them something special because first off, they know how to spell the word architect. They know it begins with A, so they might have found you in the yellow pages. And they will get, put the faith and trust in you to create a dream with them. So a simple little 2,400 square foot house, concrete block, it wraps around a garden. It's one of my neighbors. I live right down a mile from that peak there. That's Daisy Mountain, so this is New River. Again, the lushness of this desert, the richness of it. And again, galvanized metal corrugated to me is not a shock troop material of Venice, of the whole scene over here of the 70s and 80s, but it's a sacred material and it's probably the indigenous material of America. Because whether we're outside of Boston or in a sleepy little valley in the Appalachias or in the desert of Arizona or the valleys of Utah, the universal material of our history and our youth is the industrial product corrugated galvanized metal. 
and it plays with the sky, and it has great dignity, and it has the ability to empower our architecture to be kinetic and be alive. We are under the glass roof and the simple glue lamb, simple little cantilever gesture, the great room, the dining room, the kitchen, the brow opening up to the south, opening up to the view of the volcano, the polychroming, the simple red cinders that bond it with the site, the invention of windows, and again, it's about invention, and it's about commitment, and I've paid for a lot of these inventions. You know, it's the reach, will they leak, will they not leak, what's the commitment? The simple pallet, a master bedroom, a view, a south courtyard, a view to the volcano, a framing of space. And being an architect is like being a fine photographer. It's about editing and choosing views and redefining the world we live in. As you might have noted by now, orthogonal is not my favorite geometry necessarily. I do enjoy curves and I do enjoy other geometries and progressions of space. And this is a little curvilinear space done at about the same time, another rural country house of the, the desert outside Phoenix. And as it came, it also came with an agenda of materiality and budget as they all do. And this was again a late owner builder. And I find Rome as an interesting marker. These are post-Rome houses you're starting to see now as opposed to the pre-Rome work up till now. And again, it was about discovering more of what I wanted as an agenda and learning the finesse and learning the simplicity that when you look at a master work, there's a great deal of rigor and knowledge that's gone into it. And it's always about discovery and invention. We rescued four trucks, 10 wheelers from the landfill. And this is broken block that was failed at the black block plant. We had it dumped on the site of this house in the driveway that was to become. We laid it with unskilled labor. We weeped the mortar. We weren't concerned about the color of aggregates here because when it was sandblasted, it was going to be its own sort of stone. It's always amazing when you look at materials. No material is bad unless it's pretending to be something that it isn't. It's unbelievable all the energy that brick manufacturers put into building large brick to look like block, to be more efficient, to lay cheaper, and all the energy that block manufacturers make into making block that looks like brick. You know, instead of just giving us the max of the energy of the materiality of what they work with, it would be such a much better place. And yet we as architects are guilty for buying into this, this, this tomfoolery and this fakery. And instead of see searching for the integrity of what we do, buying into the cheap stagecraft of what we do. But again, a nice material a definite elegance and richness as it bonds with the ruggedness of our desert. Poor man's stone. And it's wonderful the rigor of the 8-inch module of an 8816 block broken into fabric fragments and how it empowers the scale of this building. And it's interesting the texture and the tension that divides between this wall as it comes screaming in with all its almost fear of, of toughness and and snagging your clothes or whatever, but how it blends with this polished concrete floor and this recent plywood ceiling and the translucency of the fiberglass and the, the duct insulation in between, the particle board ceiling and, or particle board walls and soundboard ceiling and half inch radial bats that, that celebrate the energy of the geometry. And Mr. Noguchi is happy there, as is Mr. Ames. And again, it's about buildings that become as much poetry and metaphor as they do pragmatism. Because again, in the search for ideas, being a yes man to your client is delivering them what they really want and not necessarily what they only say they want. You're going to, be, you're going to find that in any client encounter, it's rather amazing because you can take the half empty cup or the half full cup attitude. I find as I program intensively with clients, be they committee or individuals, that everybody might have irrationality of desire. I will, I must, I will always have this finish, I will always have this space. I will never do this. I will never damn well have an exposed duct in my house. I hate plywood. I will not. And when you survey those two extremes, they take up about 6% of the 100% spectrum leaving you 94% to play in, or 97 if you consider the, the once, and occasionally even go into the reject list if you can bring it back with intention and reason. And that's what it's all about. Here we have a space 
designed as a private patio away from in-laws, not the most honorable positioning of space, but a function of the owner's program. Private space off master bedroom so that the in-laws that help pay for the house that would visit in the desert for three months could be escaped from. And yet look at the poetry that that space presented itself with, how it redefines the sky and what a cacti is, becomes literally a contemporary kiva carved into the desert, again, from this most selfish of intentions. Again, a house of contrasts, a house I happily say with a new owner that is the right owner for the house. And again, the tension between the rustic and the rugged, the sleek and the reflective. I like to walk both lines to the edge and build the tensions into building architecture and sensual experience. And I work in neighborhoods as well. This is urban, suburban Phoenix, Arizona. A leftover remnant lot from a development of the 70s, a part of typical suburban Phoenix. An unbuildable lot, except for the vision of a client, and the des their desires and the good fortune that they, we discovered each other. It's an important house for me, a very, very important house for me, because it's, again, a quietness in suburbia. It's a tin house. We started with a tin roof. It became a tin house. Masonry garden walls. It's about positive and negative space of gardens and habitation. It's about movement along a northern edge up through a man-made canyon along this edge through four levels, feeding into various spaces. It's about the house of a very vibrant family that totally knows how to live, as have the other works that you've seen. It's about creating moments of memory and passage. It's about rising above issues like value engineering. Another dirty word and another oxymoron to an architect, value engineering. If we're architects, we should be value engineering from the get-go to have anybody imply, be it a contract manager, a contractor, or owner, that we're not doing our job is somewhat of an insult if you have any professional pride. And yet value engineering will be something that you deal with every day of your real life. And it's where you do what you do with it and where that goes. Can you imagine this house with a beautifully, perfectly articulated cast concrete stair, modulated, fountain on the edge, planters, etc., that we couldn't afford because it bid too high, suddenly we're scrambling. What do we do? How do we get from the top to the bottom? It would have been the stupidest damn solution for this house that could ever be invented. The answer was the stone that we had to quarry from the site to make the final insertion of the house, bonding the house with the site, using the artifact of excavation to really make the proper stair of this mountain courtyard home. Value engineering, I think, in the best spirit of the word, taken to that other plane. And again, it's interesting because there's a certain purity in concept. There's certain magic when you wake up in the middle of the night and you know when you go to the board that morning, there will be an idea to put on paper. There's a certain wonder in building those first models and doing those first drawings. I'm soon to find the wonder of logging it into the computer and starting to manipulate that because that's part of another tool. But there's really the wonder to realize that when we build buildings, when we make buildings, that, that exuberance, that excitement will never end till the fat lady sings. And the fat lady sings sometimes a long time after the building's finished. It always does if it's real. And what you look at is opportunities always and being able to judge those opportunities as part of your maturing and experience. All that this draws for this house when it got its building permit showed was railings at 36 inches above tow per code, end of story. At the moment, about three weeks before the completion of the house, we were walking up with temporary rails and things like that. We were getting close to calling for green tag. And suddenly the time had come when rails had to be part of the agenda. We were gonna get that green tag. We called up Arlen Lewis, our junk dog welder that really is a great human being and a great craftsman. Asked him to bring out so many sticks of inch and a quarter OD pipe back of his truck, bring your chop saw, bring a, a, a tank of gas and a, and a torch. And we started to make the rail that I could never have conceived, no matter how hard and how long I had spent on the drafting board, nor I venture to say that anybody that worked with me. It would not have nearly had the rigor and the invention of this magical lyrical line that marches up through this house to the sky. Again, invest your time carefully. You'll be working for a fee. You'll probably have a payroll to meet. You'll have to put food on a table. 
employ tools and ideas that allow you to make those accomplishments without compromise and with living up to your greatest potential. We come into the first outside garden, a little piece of yellow sky, the north side energized by the gold of the, the yellow stucco here. We've come up this canyon, the whole house is about this view facing to the, the east. We come into this great room, this is a house about stuff. And while some of us might applaud the minimalism of the first two houses I had shown you prior, this is about a house where people know how to live. Not that the others don't. I saw these trappings as I programmed and designed. It's about furniture. It's about classic pieces and love pieces. It's about a chair that Eros Saarinen, when he designed the womb, never envisioned this upholstery would appear on. <laughs> it's about artifacts and art. It's about paintings commissioned for the place. It's about one year of developing the interior as they emptied their boxes and marching towards a wedding of a daughter. It's about my finest interior and I did nothing to, to it except create the shell. I thought it was very profound. I read somewhere, I think it was in record last year when they had the interiors issue, talking about Marcel Breuer, a dyed in the wool modernist that had created a wonderful house down to the last ashtray and his sadness when he went back to the home a year after to visit the owner for dinner or whatever and realized the ashtray was in the same place. Because we should create architecture to be lived in, not to be worshipped. And what's fun about this house is people that hate modern architecture will go to dinner here, suddenly wake up after a fine meal, pause, look around, maybe see a glint of light from the reflected light off the swimming pool, on this tin structure and say, my God, this is a modern house. It's comfortable, what's wrong? Why do I like this? Please explain this. So again, an important piece of architecture for me because again, stereotypes are broken. Another understanding of what architecture can be is delivered. It's about light and shared light. It's about movement. It's always about choreography. An architect is also a dance composer. I had the pleasure of being at that first house I showed you for the school teachers with John Cage before he passed away. I went there with him and Bruno Zevi, the fine architectural critic. Bruno Zevi has written finer about my work without seeing it than most people that have seen my work. He went to the building and saw it for real and there was fear in his eyes. He was much better with the drawings at one level I sensed than with the reality. John Cage, on the other hand, fell in love again, and he'd been in many love affairs in his life, I'm sure. But as he walked through this house under construction, he put his ear to the wall, he ran his hands across columns and glass, and he had the house sing to him. And it was a very wonderful experience to, 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 to see what that man saw through his emotions without words spoken. And again, that's what architecture is all about. And here, one of the operatives was this mountain, and you can see it reflected in these different views I've been showing. This is from the upper level of the master bedroom. You lay in bed and wake up to that view. Because of the walled courtyards, because of the division of space, you have no idea that suburbia exists. And I would venture to say, if I just tell you this is on 22nd Street in Phoenix, Arizona, it'll be hard for you to find it because you'll drive by it four times before you ever see the house. It's stealth as well. And again, it's adventures, and there you can see suburbia, so it is really in suburbia, guys, and that's a mountain park and preserve, and that's the mountain the house is having its dialogue with. And I learned from lots of mentors. I've got so much baggage, it's sickening. This is Will Does Corbu. <laughs> and we climb to the sky, and we have another room of yellow in the sky, and one last moment with that mountain. And while I've done a lot of houses, I've also had the good fortune to do a lot of other things, be they car washes or grave markers or furniture, oh, be they auto shack stores or fashion boutiques, and I failed at two churches. I wasn't ready. I didn't reach far enough. I didn't know the politics of a building committee. I didn't know the selfishness of uh, what religion was about, and maybe they were both Christian places, and that's what I was raised, so I didn't have to ask hard enough questions. But fortunately, when I had the privilege of being given the task of designing a synagogue, I had to ask questions I didn't know the answers to. And I rose in the passion of a young congregation with a great rabbi to create a village, a village not only of religion, but of culture and place. 
I tried to replicate a place in the, the culture and the land that these people came from because Judaism is not merely about religion. It's really about life and values and, and surviving in, 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 a, in a hostile environment. And it was interesting because one of the failures that I'll share with you of the first churches that I did was I bought into the shtick of a young congregation that has no money and they say we will build a multi-purpose room to worship in. And that is totally the wrong operative. They should build a sanctuary to have multi-purpose functions in. It should be to worship first and to be secondary second. And fortunately, this space I had learned from the first two mistakes, and I created a space that was sacred. And by the simple gesture of 90 degrees rotation to the north or south from the eastern orientation, it becomes a great place for a spaghetti dinner or for computer classes for the preschool or for a piano concert. And yet when there's a bar mitzvah or a ba mitzvah or when it's just an ordinary moment that you're in the sanctuary by yourself, and the light dances through the space, it is truly sacred. The intention is to create a sense of community behind a wall. Again, no money. We almost debate it with the owner quite seriously not to take the commission, not to build at this point because there wasn't enough money. 1991, less than $70 a square foot to create architecture. So it became somewhat mundane. Here's orthogonal. I know when to use it, when to pull it out. We had one wall, which fortunately was our east, east wall, which separated the parking arrival garden from the compound. And we had some fun, and you can see it represented in the first gestures here in the building that we built. And it leans in a twist in the finest spirit of Mr. Geary, and it warps in on itself, and it becomes a serpentine, a mobus strip, if you will, that energizes this face to the public. It's galvanized, it's ordinary block, because you have to remember our budget. And again, the 12 ribs of galvanized metal not only become a methodology of construction, but the 12 tribes of the religion. And again, a powerfully important wall in Judaism is that wall in Jerusalem. And me, in my meager way, tried to capture a magic out of concrete block to celebrate something beyond the ordinary block. And again, I had the good fortune after 30-some years of wandering into a blockyard at high noon because I was searching and in quest of something else I was working at the time. And what I discovered when I made that wandering into the, the block yard was the magic of canyons of palletized block at high noon. And what that magic was all about was light coming down these faces of the pallets. And the fact is, as these great gang forklifts wandered through the block yard on the gravel and dirt, the block would vibrate and they'd open up the joints and look at the spontaneity of this block palette. Look at the texture. And that became the inspiration along with my desire to create a unique wall in the spirit of that place in Jerusalem that this was invented. And it's amazing because we can have the best intentions of drawings and specifications. We think we know how to talk to people. And the moment this photograph was being taken, I'm having a chat at the morning coffee break as we're laying the first sample of a wall. I'm trying to describe chaos to the mason, okay? It was a very difficult task. We had approximately 20 masons walk off the job. It was one of the harder tasks I've ever accomplished in building because what chaos to mason, he makes his living based on level and true and perfect. He works with a modular repeat unit. He's not like a carpenter. A board can become many things. A block can become few if you don't have imagination. So I'm asking these people to lay the wall crooked, to wander their face cleavage by as much as three quarters of an inch, randomly, if you will, please. <laughs> I pointed out the pallets. I described where it came from. They looked at me sort of strange and said, OK, we'll lay the sample. And they laid the sample. And I came back a day later, and what had become chaos? Chaos had become a musical score. One, three, seven, nine, one, three, seven, nine. <laughs> and if you go to this job, you will still see the sample wall on the north edge of the courtyard off the sanctuary. Because I left it as a life lesson. And fortunately, two days later, because this was a struggle, the superintendent's flipping out, we're losing time on the job, we got a deadline to get kids in classes, and we can't figure out how to lay the damn walls. 
The superintendent says one day, he calls me and says, come on down here, I think we got the answer. You know, it's a purely physical act. We have to take their mind out of it. So the act became pulling the string. The instruction was to lift your block. First you set your, your bed joint of mud. You got it all ready to receive the block, okay? You lift your block. As long as the block hits the wall within a half inch of the string, you're done. Don't think. <laughs> Level the block, okay, and move on. And it, it, it made the wall on the right. I mean, suddenly it was so obvious, okay? But then I was winning, and then I was really intrigued, and I said, well, now I want all the head joints to vary from anywhere from an eighth to an inch. And yet it happened. And look at how the light dances with it. I mean, it comes alive, and there is no pattern. This is chaos. But again, it was this communication between the mason, the craftsman, the superintendent, the crazy architect, all these people sort of working towards that end. This screed of concrete is another story, because this is, again, a lesson that was about learning about mock-up, about whatever, and this is what a texture can be about screeding, because again, what I was searching for was this point of history. Simple first steps, 12 classrooms, sanctuary as multi-purpose, small administration. And again, what I was looking for in the rigor of this place was the rigor and scale of these streets. The texture of the paving, the texture of the wall, the butterflies of corrugated plastic, and again, I cannot tell you the power of this space and the goosebumps I felt and the memories I have from the moment that we dedicate it and we moved from a sukkah, which was made of palm fronds back here with the Torahs in a, in a temporary ark, the scrolls of the religion being brought through this space with 700 people crowded in this little street, much as it would be in this community, and taken to the sanctuary on the first day of services. I mean, that is why we do architecture. And again, architecture is empowered by people. It's their scale, it's their character, it's their being that we serve. And again, we learn a window at Acoma Pueblo, Sky Pueblo, outside of Albuquerque. Mud walls, schist window. Block walls, aluminum frame, quarter inch plate, and silicone. Same scale, same module. Different things to be seen from both windows. And I didn't have any money to play with anything but an orthogonal plan, but I certainly had money to play with section. So every roof is a different butterfly, and it marches down the space and it energizes with south light and north light. And as you move through each two classrooms, eight inches occurs, and so as you grow from crib to maturity, the room grows in eight inch increments. And again, architecture happens. Another interior that I can't take credit for. How could I have been clever enough to invent these wonderful people hanging from their ears? <laughs> you know, how could I have picked all the fabrics and done all the art in this room? But again, I get great satisfaction because this harkens back to my first memory of, of school and one of my great memories of architectural school, the Crow Island School by the Serenins. And here's that sanctuary that's a multi-purpose room. And here's our sketch of what it might be. And the reality of what it was is so, so much better. And when I go places, I don't want to just bring Will Bruder. That's not what the issue is about. And I think as architects, we really have to re really be responsible to that reality. You know, it's one thing to promise we'll re reinvent ourselves and go up on a mountaintop off the 405 and build what's being built. And really, what have we learned in life? It's another thing to go to a place and discover the magic of that place and be privileged to be asked to work in that community. So with a library I was commissioned to do a couple of years ago in Jackson that grew into two other commissions, I started to understand place. And the power of the snow and the power of the haystacks and the muffins in South Park and the power of intentional architecture, the first piece and one of the great pieces of the region, in the Old Faithful Inn at Yellowstone helped me to understand what making architecture was about in this place. And I created what I consider a very quiet, modest building of wood and log and has the energy of place. It plays with the curve of Buffalo Way. Little three-story advertising agency for a, a, a firm that's gaining national recognition. Isn't that a quiet building? I mean, it's, it's just a, a building. 
We've been on the front page of the newspaper for about eight months now. I had a mayor who has recently begrudgingly approved my most recent efforts in the community, following the vote by asking the city planner to pass laws to prohibit the plague from continuing. But again, it's a, just an architecture that's inspired by the materials, by the forms, by the history of the place. You can see, maybe nobody's ever seen cantilevered logs 28 foot out of the front of a building. But it's log, it's another gesture, it's another welcome. It's the plane of glass, it's devising workspaces, it's rigor of the muffins, it's the rigor of the, the, the galvanized metal of the ranch and the farm. And again, carpenters don't have the problems masons do. I just show you this as evidence. Tim C. O'Carlin and his air nail gun here had no problem doing my jazz wall here. It took me about an hour to make work with two carpenters to lay up the randomness of this sample for the board reverse pat pattern. I then walked around the Tyvek with a big marker and marked where I wanted the, the emphasis of the rhythm. And then I said, I'll be back in two months. Give me a wall. And this wonderful wall grew. And doesn't it have great rigor to it? The leaning wall on the west that harkens back to the Hardeman Barn over at Snake River Institute. Just a quiet little building. Don't know what the ruckus is about. We come down the entryway, the logs continue in for counterbalance, of course, we ramp down into an atrium. And again, I think I did learn something from that great space at Old Faithful Inn. And we have three simple log columns. This is truly a Wyoming building. And we have a little bit of cable lighting floating here and a little elevator that doesn't have a shaft to the amazement of the Otis people when they came to install. They, uh, what, what, where's the shaft? Well, we, we thought that was a shaft on the drawing. No, it's not a shaft. Well, why don't we have a special cab? Well, we can't afford a special cab. So instead, we use some perforated. We paint a, a firewall purple or a wall purple. We work with that cab and we look about light and carving light. And we have the challenge here of taking a business that was on one floor of a small office and turning it into a three-level operation and keeping a sense of family. And again, this atrium becomes not only a place of light, but it becomes almost the hearth where the family gathers. And productivity and camaraderie is up, not down, because of the architecture. That's about having fun with materials. And the south stair is about east light and about an energized red wall and industrial treads. And the north stair tower has west light and glue lamp treads and an OSB wall. Two paths vertically through a space, three paths if you count the elevator. But again, it's about movement. It's about a little power conference room overlooking the town of Jackson. It's about structure. It's about earthquake four. It's about 75 pound snow loads. It's about creating a sense of privacy and place in the wilderness, in the urban banality of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a town soon becoming Disney if they don't watch out. It's a decision to place a windowsill at four foot two inches, not where I would like it or where Edward Riddell, the owner, would like it, both of us standing more than six foot tall, but where Lee Riddell and the 90% female staff would be most appropriately served. The intention is to set the windowsill and the head at six foot one, such that when you come in, you cannot see the sky, but when you sit down, you're given a postcard of nature and the town is taken away from your viewplane. So study area, sales space, design space, computer screen, everybody has a postcard of the nature they came here to love. And the elevator, standard cab. We got the cheapest, cheapest 305 elevator that Otis could sell. We told them nothing of our intention of making something special. Because if any of you ever work with an elevator, you will know immediately that the money comes from the custom sexy cabs. What we have here is after the elevator had been installed, balanced, approved by all inspection, we had the carpenter cut five holes in the elevator. <laughs> this one's in the floor. These are in the wall. These are sandblasted aluminum frames by my junk dog welder, glazed FedEx the next day, and placed in that elevator for $570, the cheapest renovation you'll ever have of an elevator cab. And now we're going to start the library portion of the evening. And this is the first library collection in Phoenix. It's a petroglyph site. There's 1,600 books in the collection. 
Their uh, reference collection, they don't move. This is in the face of an earthen dam, the Corps of Engineers. It's a little 7,000 square foot building that s took six years to accomplish. You can see how it plays against the great work of the engineer here, this marker of an earthen dam two miles long. It becomes a time machine in the best spirit of Jules Verne, taking you from the mundanity of suburbia that's grown over here, up a ramp, through a transition of learning, dumps you out here, scrims it away with some perforated, onto a little trail out to discovery. It's a simple, cheap, tilt-up warehouse just like we sit in tonight. A little skewed geometry. Most people kept asking me to draw the real plan at night, the isometric. A little bit of tribute to Richard Serra and the graphic plate here. Three-quarter inch plate steel. A little burn out, burned out etching here of two of our petroglyphs. A little warehouse. You move off terra firma onto a bridge. The scrim playing with your perception of the landscape. moving through the dawn, moving up the bridge. And again, the skin you see here is copper slag. The building is stealth. Its intention is to be geologic, not architectural. The idea is to find a materiality that would blend with the dark desert varnish of the mountain beyond. Copper slag from a, again, slag heap at Superior's copper mine was the solution. Laid in the bottom of the concrete forms, picked up like pineapples on an upside down pineapple cake and glazing and adorning the exterior skin. We move through the compression of space. We go towards vistas of view and skylight. Video chamber displays skylight movement out the back door, onto the trail, out to the object with a few remnants of our trellis being left littered in the, the passageway, providing shelter from the sun. Can we change the trays then, please? I started doing my first public work in the, after I, when I was on my own in the late 70s. And I suggest that all of you don't just accept the reality that because you're doing something interesting and getting an article here and there and people are saying nice things about you, that you will be asked to perform in the public arena. It is not part of the public methodology. There's a form called a 254. If you have any intentions of practicing in the public realm, please fill one out soon. Because the bureaucrat doesn't have any method for evaluating you without this form. It's tedious. I put it in the round file for all too many years. Fortunately, realized that after two or three, woke up and said, why isn't this happening? And filled one out. I was at a table with 3,600 other architects for a small 10,000 square foot branch library. And I got lucky and got the job. I've worked in libraries. I enjoy the building type. It has great dignity. It has great vision. It has great energy and great love to it. It's one of my favorite building types. I like working in the public realm. I like working in the private realm. I haven't found too much love for the commercial realm. When we look at the left here, we look at Phoenix Library, circa end of 19th century, the first postmodern plague. It was Andrew Carnegie. Classicism was the rule and the invention of the free library, which is an American invention, was totally invigorated by a gift and generosity of the robber baron Carnegie to build 3,000 libraries. Phoenix got their first real library at the end of the 19th century, and it served the city for over 50 years. In 1951, not having the courage to reach farther for architecture, they chose a student of right rather than right. Got an OK building by Alden Dow and Blaine Drake. A civic center complex, a public library that served the city from 1951 to 1995. Again, not too shabby by contemporary standards. But the needs grew. We had the courage to pass a billion dollar bond issue. And this is a city that had grown from the, smoky, the quiet little dusty place at the end of World War II of maybe 125,000 people into the urban megapolis of two and a half million people. And little did I know in the early 70s when my brother-in-law took this photo leaving town that this library here would be so close to the adjacency of the library that I would create recently on the edge of what was not urban blight and renewal, but a covered freeway to LA from Florida, the I-10, on the edge of a park in a desert city that was growing to maturity. A small-scale model talking about how an architect with five guys in a little desert studio talks about big ideas of what a cultural institution can mean to a city. 
a building seven foot long by three foot wide at Hunter's scale in Basswood with a thousand cars and 2,000 people walking the street at Hunter's scale with the integration of ideas and visions for the city and the abstraction of a clear acrylic crystal showing that we had no preconceptions. Napkin sketches and, uh, at restaurants are the fantasy of movies and arrogant architects. They are not the grounding necessarily of great ideas. You make the biggest mistake for yourself and do your clients and yourself the greatest disservice by preconceiving ideas. Know the rigors of the need you've been assigned to attack and challenge. Know your community, know your budget, know all the realities and then with those empowering you, knowledge does empower one, go forward to dream and make dreams that will be more substantive, more valid, more magical, more poetic, and easier to sell because through the wisdom of the knowledge you've gained about your task, your project will gain a reality and an ownership of the clients you work for. So we started from this abstraction, the first when the bond issue was passed, we had five cultural, four cultural buildings on the menu. I had the audacity to think that I might be the gun designer that should design this building. I did not go racing out of town to find my magic mate somewhere else in the pantheon of current architecture. And what I did instead was I looked for the mate that I had always wanted to work with, which was a great engineer. And I again called before this was even really a reality of an RFQ. I, I didn't even know LA existed at the time as far as Arabs, and I called London. And I talked to a friendly gentleman there, and they were very positive, and I talked about this maybe building in the future. As the maybe building became reality, Charlene came over as part of the efforts to see who the hell this was, and I got their sole commitment on this project, which I still don't quite figure out, but of the 26 teams that came to play, Arabs was only on my team. This was not about the carnival of a design competition. Design competitions are a sickness and a plague in America. They do not result somehow in architecture in our land. The only two competitions worth a shit in America were the St. Louis Arch and the Vietnam Wall. And they didn't have much pragmatism to their rigor. But they have been truly market things of our culture that we can all be proud of. But architecture is a different animal and it's not about bending a bunch of superstars to come before whatever perverted jury they might, to be selected over cartoons and drawings and models, be it for a Nova special on educational TV, or be it to any of our local communities, when have we seen real architecture work? Because when we disconnect architecture that far from our client, there can be no resolution of both the pragmatism and the built reality in my mind. Somehow Europe's got it figured out better, but we haven't yet. So this was about credentials and portfolio. Standing at one side, I had Overup. Standing the other side to give me the depth of purpose was one of the oldest firms in Phoenix, a 40-year-old firm that had great integrity, had a great designer at first, had gotten a little bit tired, a little bit stodgy, still had their integrity, done a couple university libraries, major civic work, and I went to them, they didn't come to me, and we made a marriage, and it was a very, very wonderful marriage and I owe them a great deal for their faith in the journey that we pursued together as equals. And the building you're about to see grew from that relationship. <laughs> and the building that we're about to see grew very much because of the Blockbuster video and the Walden Bookstore and the Foods Court and the Mega Mall. Because before it was fashionable to think this way, I fortunately had good mentoring in my, my library roots. I had one of the most avant-garde librarians existing in the world and his protege, June Garcia, and Charlie Robinson from Baltimore County, who was putting display shelving in libraries and putting comic books there and knowing what the computer was about and know what marketing was about for the user that he was to serve. And it's really funny to read the metropolis that came yesterday to my desk about, quote, the new library of the future that I've known about for 25 years by good fortune. And this building and this building is what a contemporary library must be about. And a library has always been librarians as the caretaker of knowledge, uh, caretakers of knowledge as evidenced in the card catalogs that we all have learned to live with and, and grow from. 
But now librarians are the navigators of knowledge and they fly this little wonderful machine here into a new universe. So the library is an exciting project because it's both about the art of the book and the archival of history and the magic of the future. And again, this will be the only view you see tonight of Troya, a middle ground library that I completed in the 90s, the most controversial building of its day. Some said they'd seen better cotton sheds than this library, and I said thank you. But my librarian did me great service by telling the room full of architects looking at the RFQ that he didn't, damn well didn't want any fancy ass architecture. That's not quite a straight quote. I mean, this is a religious man, but th th that was the intention, that he just wanted a box, a simple box. And to the wonder, about a third of the people in the room did not submit an RFQ because they did not want to work with an arrogant client like this, a man of su such little vision that merely wanted to put them into builders of, being builders of boxes. But again, I am the ultimate regionalist. This is a 19th century warehouse on the railroad tracks in Phoenix. It's a masonry building with a metal roof. It's a building that stored the riches at that time of our community, which was the wealth of agriculture, the cotton, the grain, the citrus. And a warehouse is what a library is about because it's about flexibility. It's about change being the inevitable for a library. And it's about creating a diagram that celebrates that flexibility. So we proudly built a box. It's a 32 foot eight grid. We have two floor plates, an acre and a half inside and three an acre in size. We have moved all the normal core functions of a building into the saddlebags, the saddlebags of service that embrace our east and west flanks. Emergency stairs, telecommunication and electrical risers, mechanical rooms, restrooms, service elevators, janitor's closets, all taken out such that these are all temporary partitions that could be gone almost at the blink of an eye. We opened one small core of less than two bays up the heart of our building, renamed it a Crystal Canyon because we couldn't use the dirty word atrium. Atrium is a four letter word to a librarian that knows his business because it wrecks total chaos at architectural caprice. This became merely a diagram for understanding vertical circulation of the public up one grand stair and three glass elevators. So we created a box in Phoenix, because fortunately I realized that box was not a dirty word. Mr. Kahn, Mr. Vandero definitely taught us that there are boxes that aren't dirty words. But fortunately, Mr. Gowdy also lived, and there are other things than boxes to build. And fortunately, you know, we, we had a different insight into what architecture was about than BB in, in Chicago. The ultimate insult to American architecture, the George Washington Library opened a few years ago to the folly of a competition. It's hard to fathom that this building is a mere two blocks from Louis Sullivan's auditorium, you know, about two miles from Oak Park, about four blocks from East Vondero's federal complex. Not only a disaster of aesthetics, but a disaster of function a boutique library of the versed category. When I say boutique library, I'm referring to the phenomenon of the 50s and 60s to the present of creating libraries that are supposedly touchy-feely because they're set up like department stores with the perfume collection and the Ralph Lauren collection and all these wonderful things, forgetting that libraries are different than department stores in the sense that a department store is about capturing you to get lost in a maze to buy junk you shouldn't buy, point of purchase purchases, and a library is about access and ease of understanding and utility because we never have enough building or money to staff our libraries anymore because we're so concerned about not paying our fair share of taxes. But again, BB had another vision, and it deserves the X, and it's unfortunately the blight of that city, as well as a sad moment in architectural history. We chose instead to look at the vision of a man like Sid Mead, the futurist, whose writs are in California. Again, these montage pieces here. And it's funny how this could be Chayad Day, or maybe it could be a library in Phoenix with its great curved shadow over the street. But the vision is about the future. And we figured out where to look in Paris, not the outside, BB. Look on the inside, guy. You know, LeBruce was pretty damn good. The first great use of wrought iron, great skylit sp space, a building that just brings your heart soaring. We have the book, we have the celebration of knowledge, and in 1861, we have all the technology and we have people sitting down here 
with the control of their destiny of environment with a little green reading light that they control to do the research and search for the knowledge of this treasure house. So we did learn from Rolla Bruce. We learned from the same building that Bibi learned from, different lessons. And what the hell has this got to do with the diagram? Wait a second. The grain elevator, back to where you're at, where you came from. Never forget the person that brought you to the dance. Suddenly I had this big Cracker Jack job, and I figured, hey, there's a new world out here. I'm working with these Cracker Jack engineers. I'm doing all these neat things. You know, all this stuff's happening. And so I called some fancy names in the catalog, suites, you know. That's the first time I almost used them because they were normally for building models because yeah, I like to invent more basic things. And uh, I called, it was some company, I think, across the ocean. It was a long distance call. And I started talking about a copper skin because I thought that was appropriate to the image of this building. And you know, I knew if I built a, a big tin warehouse, you know, it would, uh, you know, I'd be accused of all kinds of things. And yet copper seemed appropriate. We're the copper state. There was this whole vision we had going. And I made my first phone call to this wall supplier. I think maybe they, they, they had bid on, on Hong Kong Bank, you know, and they had really new skins. And they called back quickly after their heart started, stopped pounding hard, you know, because you, you say, what, a whole central library? How many square feet of copper? And they quoted immediately $120 a square foot per skin. Okay, well, I had less than $100 a square foot to build the building, not the skin. So needless to say, I didn't have to waste another phone call back to ask more about why. I just abandoned that source, and I said, now, how do we get a metal skin on this building? And I fortunately remember these grain elevators behind the old Hayden flour mill erected in about 1972 to my pleasure and my infatuation with my Midwestern roots. This is two Balin grain elevators. All these little crimps and creases in this metal are about metal efficiency. These structures are as, almost as pure as a Bucky Fuller dome. Every undulation has to do with how fine a gauge of galvanized can we put through the mill and gain structural integrity. There's sinusoidal curves, and there's great integrity, not decoration, in this skin. So this became the way the building was allowed to grow and meet its responsibility of budget. And again, you know, Frank's taught me a lot of things, the Frank, the ultimate Frank. The, uh, you know, Johnson's Wax is a wonderful, great reading room. It's about light, it's about space, and these columns were very important, as you'll see in a moment. And again, the tens tensegrity of Mr. Fuller, or the tensegrity of interpretation in Snelson's sculpture here in Kansas City, is about what we were searching for, because it was always not only about the rigor of building, but the magic of metaphor that the pursuit was about. And as I looked at what the building had to become, there were some struggles, there were some dead ends, there were spin handlers, there was a... Uh, the, the, the learning of a bureaucracy, there was talk radio, there were many things, but fortunately I was rising to the occasion. As I looked at what I wanted this building to become, I was more convinced than ever as I saw things happen that I didn't want it to look like a building. I wanted to hearken back to the geology and the scale of the place that I call home, this energy of the West, and much as the mountains of Phoenix really are its markers, much more than any built artifact, I wanted to create a metaphorical abstraction of a mesa, if you will, a copper-clad mesa carved by a stainless steel canyon that plays with the sunrise and sunset, open and transparent to the north and the south. And we set forth on that venture. Our site was five acres. I had 26 public meetings as part of listening. I wrote a 650-page program personally with my staff. I went to all the meetings to dialogue to learn what the essence of the building was. Every one of the citizens' meetings, be it with the homeless, be it with the young, be it with the neighborhood historic groups or the minorities, nobody wanted to talk about a library, nobody wanted to talk about books or architecture, they wanted to talk about parking spaces. Every damn meeting was about parking first and building secondary. So we have five parking gardens, which are desert gardens, and they're part of the, the placement of the building and very important. The building became the big box that Ralph Edwards desired. We had one level here at the base, which was popular culture. It was like junk food. It was like the Circle K. You come in, you've got the new books, you've got genre, you've got fiction, you've got CDs, you've got videos. You've got a children's library, you've got the in-out, just like the mall functions of our fast, everyday culture. Level two is an acre and a half of the information highway. Mainlining down the center with all the techie stuff, 
perimeter to the things we might recognize as careers in law, maps, appliances, auto manuals, and traditional reference. Level three became the heart of the administration, not only for this building, but the library system. Level four is closed stacks. And level five became the move of the day where we moved the collection circulating nonfiction and 250 reading positions into the acre of the space at the top of our mesa, turning it into the best public room in the city. We'd seen all too many libraries that had squandered the opportunity by closed stacks and administrator's offices, and we could not let that happen. We're in a city that is basically flat, that many people will never go up in an elevator, and so to see our landscape by our populace through the editing of architecture was a very important move. And we never had a dull day in construction. We bid after a scary moment of not feeling there'd be enough money in the tax rolls after pressure from our friends. We dug or drilled 80-foot caissons. And because of the integrity of the structure, our saddlebags were not only about service to mechanicals and service to, to, to the, the, the mundanities at one level of the building, but they also service the structure. And the whole lateral system, east-west, is in these great steel trusses anchored to the caissons that grew first so we had the saddlebags and the sculpture of them rising immediately to form not only the rigor of future support, but the bracing for the precast system that grew between the embrace of the saddlebags. And again, remember, we have less than $100 a square foot to meet the day. Everything had to be reinvented, reanalyzed. Every challenge had to be double asked. We bid eventually 0.03% from where our cost estimator said we would. And it was because of moves like this. We're looking at a casting bed of virgin steel, eight foot two wide. Excuse me, yeah, eight foot two. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Anyways, eight foot two wide. And we have a 12 inch thick panel because it's thermal mass. There's no insulation in our exterior walls because again, part of the joy of our engineers was the integrated approach to talking about not only structure, but electrical, mechanical, all in the same breath, trying to envision totality of ideas. And in devising these 12 foot thick uninsulated walls, we had to find a texture. What is the surface? What can we afford? Well, we couldn't afford the rigor of a classical module, alignment of perfection in these walls. And as we drove to the yard the first time, we were talking to the precasters to see what their tricks were and what they could do. They had a demonstration fence along the parking lot. And as you walked along the fence, you went from rough screeded concrete to the pristineness of the finest aggregate that made concrete look more like plastic or movies or you know, videotape than reality. And we said, we can't get to the other side of the fence. Let's stop at the first panel and ask the question, what can we do with screeded concrete? We screeded the panels once. They wanted to give us their best finisher and their best foreman for our sampling. We said wrong. We, we already had matured through that phase. So we asked for two competent laborers that looked like they knew how to work. We gave them a two by four. We asked them to make their first pass, consolidate the surface, start on their second path. The instructions were randomly between eight and 22 inches. We would like you to make a ripple pattern of screeding. We would like you to pause at those moments, try and stay horizontal. It's not really totally critical push down on your two by four into the wet mud, pull straight up and keep on trucking. You can see the pattern evolving. You can see what the casting left after it was sandblasted. You can see the rigor of a wall that's more about geologic metaphor. This is jazz, not classical music, folks. And it's a tinker toy and that's a part of the budget as well. As many repeats of parts gave the rigor for the building to grow. And there's tons of stories. We could go on for four days just talking about this building. And you wonder, my God, here we get to the great reading room. We're talking about flexibility. We're talking about the freedom of floor plate. And all of a sudden, we have a forest of columns, and you got these Cracker Jack engineers. What the hell is this all about? Because it would have been nothing for Michael and team to have spanned 167 feet wall to wall. No brainer. Not a great span. But as we looked at the function of this public place, we thought of the children and the people that would use it. 
we thought of their gesture of scale, would have it been the right gesture to create an aircraft hangar or an exposition hall, column free, for them to search for knowledge? No, instead we chose to create a forest, a hypostyle hall, a building scaled at the humanity of a thousand square foot apartment or house that has the bearing and the rigor of expressing the building, but as it reaches to the sky, it's no longer about the muscularity of concrete and precast and 155 pound live loads. It's about a different loading agenda, so it tapers to 10 inches at the top and it greets the cable structure above. I stopped at Michael's place on the way over here. He's out on his own now. There's, everybody's still friends, but he's flying his own trip right now. And he had some of our original models, and it's funny because how time changes memories, how pure they get over time. Our remembrance is that Wendell and I were sitting there sketching, and we came up with basic parameters and basic ideas in the grid, and we were so proud of ourselves, and we made the decision for columns. And we sent a sketch over that was a building section that had some columns shown. And all we knew was that the roof had to be steel. Steel had to be light. We had just done some disastrous trusses with another engineer. They were way too heavy, and we weren't going to repeat that mistake. So we wanted cables. You know, we wanted metal. We didn't know what the hell that meant. So we sent this little section on the fax machine. We remember very quickly the fax came back in two weeks. It seemed quick at the time. Two weeks later, we get a fax back from Arabs, and here's our roof. And all of a sudden, it's tensegrity. And all of a sudden, memories of Bucky Fuller are recalled. And this little hybrid that never had been done. And it was that simple. And yet, I saw the models of the evolution that I had forgotten in my memory this afternoon. And it wasn't quite that simple. But the idea was cooked in two weeks. And through lots of modeling, and lots of searching, and lots of invention, and in the end, about two stacks of computer printouts, printouts about five foot high each, we came to the reality of a built reality. And what was the scariest for the bureaucrats in our city, this roof that could, had never been done. And with great fear and trepidation, we somehow bullied our way to its being. The guys to do it, Bird Air, who normally do fabric and cables, were coming here to do cable and composite steel, had just come from a 700-foot, I think, clear span in Southeast Asia, hit our job site, and asked what the task of the day would be. The foreman pointed up to this little 32-foot-8 grid and said, you're going to stretch cables across this grid. They sort of smiled and laughed, and it was one of the most smooth operations of the whole construction. And yet, how the city feared it. So here we're tweaking up the model, we're stretching, we're, we're bringing it into tension, we're suddenly floating purlins, because on top of this little magic of cables is an ordinary warehouse roof. Instead of glue line purlins like we sit under tonight, we have steel tubes. We have a nine-inch box rib deck that's acoustic, rolled to a 2,000-foot radius. And again, one of the failings of the building you have here that it really amazes me in the couple times I've been here, you know, it's almost, I mean, it could be sunlight out today and we wouldn't know the difference. This could be a noon lecture. I mean, how do you people live without the light? You should be cutting all kinds of holes. You've been in this building so long. Why aren't you carving the hell out of the roof? Because again, the roof is about the sky. It's about bonding with light, and you see the start of a 300-foot-long gesture because our roof never meets the wall. And there we are at Balin, and we're rolling copper from Germany. And this mill right here in Balin, Nebraska, in Lincoln, outside Lincoln, the week before had been making galvanized grain elevators. They barely wiped the rolls, they barely put fresh rolling oil on and send our copper through. Then the adventure was over and they were back to making grain elevators. But for one week in the history of this plant, they made beautiful copper skins for a metaphorical mesa growing in the desert of Arizona. The Phoenix Public Library, a mesa bridging a freeway, a building that has scale at 50, 60 miles an hour from a freeway stack, has scale if you're walking down the main street of the city, becomes part of a geological icon and not merely a piece of architecture. How many floors, how many levels? It's over 100 feet tall. How can it only be five stories? One building in the day, another building at night. Because a good deal of its skin is perforated, so it becomes pompadou, it exposes itself at night. It's about stagecraft, it's about theater, it's about film, it's about the minimal artists that I love and respect. 
It's about all the baggage I've carried for 49 years, all the energy that the team brought to it, Wendell and Carl, Michael and Jacob, and all the people, Alan's and all the people that brought to it, Roger the lighting designer and Steve Martino the landscape ar architect, and a long list and cast of characters which appear on the building block or the building plaque in this, this building, another rule broken. building on the park that becomes a lantern on the park at night. Again, the building is fortress-like on its east and west, about climate, about place, about presence in the, in the landscape of the community. And yet the north and south walls, the south you're looking at here, which is our most severe solar condition in this hemisphere, is about glass totally. And the books and the librarians and the patrons become actors throughout the day and night in the city that we call home. And these louvers are driven by 11 motors, prefabricated in Germany, driven by software programmed out to 2040 because it isn't solar software, it's about plots of the sun that can be calibrated in the computer. At high noon at winter, it looks like there's no window on the south, and yet by nightfall you realize the transparency in the lantern the building becomes. Again, the building has tectonics about it. And the north side is about glass as well. But it's glass on the north and the desert at 35 degrees latitude, that's a different story. And you can see for five hours each day, two and a half at dawn, two and a half at dusk, these wonderful 28 sails, fixed in tension, shade the north skin. And you can see them working here. The building should shift it to pass to provide part of the shade. The building was moving so fast as it came to southern Arizona from the north that the saddlebags almost fell off the sides as it raced to downtown. And again, it's about optimism of the future. We can't grow across the freeway, we can grow north. So all this structure is expressed on the north as ornament.